This conference will now be recorded. Hi, thank you so much for joining me. This is uh, Dr. Bill Owens. And I wanted to take just a little bit of time to sort of walk you through the progression of um, modernized chiropractic care and kind of where we fit into the algorithm of, of just managing patients. And the best way to touch on that is really um, sort of outlining chiropractic's place in spine care with particular focus on the diagnosis and management of the mechanical component of spine pain. And, you know, as you can see under my name here, um, adjunct professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomechanical Sciences and Family Medicine. And I do spend a lot of time teaching third and fourth year medical students, as well as uh, residents about the place of mechanical spine pain in healthcare and the best way to manage it without the use of drugs or surgery. I'm also an adjunct uh, postgraduate faculty at Cleveland University, Kansas City College of Chiropractic, adjunct professor of clinical science at Texas Chiropractic College, adjunct associate professor of clinical science at University of Bridgeport, and I'm a certified physician educator uh, in the through the Royal College of Physicians. I went through that program in 2016, and I was actually the first chiropractor to do that. Um, out of that Royal College uh, training came um, the first major fellowship in chiropractic care, uh, which is a fellowship in spinal biomechanics and trauma, which is a two-year program and includes um, 12 clinical rotations with virtually every medical specialty um, as far as related to spine. Um, and about 400 research articles that are read and summarized. So the, the level of training that we're engaged in, specifically with the Academy of Chiropractic, is putting out the doctors that uh, understand the demographics and the clinical need for a primary type of spine care provider, but they also understand that they're just one piece of a wheel and that um, communicating interprofessionally with primary care in particular is, is really uh, the future. So let's just take a walk through some of these basic concepts and I don't wanna keep you here for a really long time, but we're gonna to touch base on a few important topics. Uh, in the first um, slide here, I wanna really discuss phases of care. And this is where a properly trained chiropractor uh, has the tools to, to manage a lot of these cases. And the idea is that we're taking the burden off of the primary care physicians that are really focused on internal medicine. And, and, and it's a really good partnership. You know, when you have a patient that has an internal medicine disorder and like blood pressure or COPD or the myriad of things that a primary care office has to manage, and then they have a mechanical spine pain issue or even a herniated disc on top of that, it, it's hard for the primary care doctor to manage both because they're operating in an internal medicine paradigm. Uh, it's very similar to a chiropractor. You know, we're really good at the mechanical side, but you know, managing internal um, visceral disease is going to be a difficulty for us. So if we team up and we both understand what each other does, the, the person that really benefits the most is the patient. So when we go through the different phases of care, in, in the spine pain patient. It used to be historically that we talked about the spine pain patient as acute, subacute, or chronic. Um, and those are really more uh, terms that relate to the uh, wound repair in the body um, and, and related to pain, not necessarily related to a phase of care. So one of the things that's really been modernized is the first phase, which is pain relief. And um, the research is showing that spinal manipulation does modulate pain at the central nervous system level. So when patients come in, that first phase of care is just getting them to feel comfortable. And it's what's really interesting is we're having significant success with this using a hands-on mechanical approach where we don't have to necessarily use narcotic medication. Some of those patients, in fact, most of those patients can get by with an over-the-counter analgesic while they're under chiropractic care. And as you know, with the opioid epidemic and this just crisis of nobody really knowing what to do, a provider that can actually manage pain um, a little bit more holistically or non-narcotic wise with a hands-on approach that actually engages the patient in their own care 
is really uh, is really really needed. But the key to this early phase is really, you know, obviously we want to make the patient comfortable and manage their pain, but it's critical that we get an accurate diagnosis. And the Academy of Chiropractic doctors are trained to understand that. And we need to know early on, is this an infection in the spine? Is it a disc herniation? Is it a nerve problem? Is it a fracture? All of the things that would be the type of diagnoses that would be triaged to a medical provider, typically spine surgeon or pain management doctor. And we know historically that that's a very small percentage of the global sort of epidemic of spine pain. Most of it is mechanical. The, the patients that need to be abruptly triaged are probably less than 5%. So we want to train to be able to recognize that 5% but we want to create a system that's based on helping the 95% because that's the majority of, of what, what, what's coming in. And what's important in diagnosis really is access to care. And um, we're going to get to that in a minute. But what the, the most recent research is really showing, and, and this is out of the European Spine Journal in 2018. And interestingly enough, uh, the research that was published related to the management of pain with spinal manipulation was really, uh, that really hit its peak in about 2011, 2012. So that's about seven years ago. And that's pretty well ingrained in the mechanical spine pain community, particularly chiropractic. You know, we've seen that for a really long time. And we're just really starting to be utilized uh, as a provider at that level. But when you look at uh, the new research and the biomechanical side, you know, this article is titled Aberrant Intervertebral Motion, which means abnormal, uh, uh, Aberrant Intervertebral Motion in Patients with Treatment-Resistant Nonspecific Low Back Pain. Now, that's a lot to be said in there, but basically what it said is this paper was looking at abnormal vertebral body motion in patients that had nonspecific low, pain, low back pain that weren't responding to treatment. And nonspecific is sort of an interesting word. Um, that's really synonymous with mechanical, and that's what we teach in the family medicine program. Nonspecific means there's not a specific anatomical lesion that is completely um, related causally to their back pain. And again, that means biomechanical pain, mechanical pain. So the reason that we've known in chiropractic um, that the treatment is resistant is because the, the treatment is being provided in an internal medicine paradigm, not in an engineering or a mechanical paradigm. And that's where a properly credentialed and trained chiropractor can, can be a very useful part uh, of a major um, program. Now, what they said further in this paper was very interesting. Mechanical factors appear to be prominent in treatment resistant back pain. Those mechanical factors um, need to be diagnosed first, right? So this is more about diagnosing early on that there's a significant mechanical factor, getting them to a properly trained uh, chiropractor to stabilize that, okay? That's where we're gonna avoid unnecessary surgery. We're gonna avoid um, opioid prescriptions. We're gonna avoid a, a rush down a ineffective pathway that's really gonna be harmful from a financial perspective. Um, in the healthcare system as well as the patient. So um, they, they state that, that this paper may suggest that motion sharing inequality, which means a biomechanical problem, is associated with pain from muscle fatigue and metabolic buildup. Uh, further clinical studies are needed. You know, we've seen these things um, all the time. That, that's what a properly trained chiropractor will do. And as I mentioned earlier, early access to this type of an evaluation, you know, I, I really like to discuss the simple fact that it's not one thing or the other. You know, a, a patient comes in and they can have both an anatomical component, a disc herniation, a sprain strain, and also on top of that, a mechanical component. And I have had numerous patients that have avoided surgery or avoided narcotic medication because we got the biomechanical component stabilized first. But we want to do that sooner rather than later. Okay. And in this study in 2015 in the Journal of Pain Research, 
stated that such studies, among others, also firmly support the early access of patients with non-malignant spine pain to assessment with an emphasis on triage and diagnosis and appropriate treatment to achieve the best possible results. They also observed that delaying the assessment and early triage of spine pain patients can have a more negative effect than previously thought. These patients sort of get stuck in this pain pattern. And when we focus on just treating the pain and not looking at the cause of it, we're not doing that patient a proper level of service that they desire or that they um, deserve, right? So understanding the biomechanical aspect of spine pain and having a provider that can work with and stabilize that is really the missing link to all this, you know, and, and when we talk about uh, safety, you know, this is, you know, when I first started lecturing about this at the medical school, you know, th this was all new and shiny and unbelievable, but, you know, now we're living it, you know, this was published in 2016. And, um, you know, those are the CDC guidelines. Th this crisis was going on since 2001 before we even had these guidelines. And now it's three years later and it just doesn't seem to be abating. Um, but, you know, the bottom um, paragraph is the one that really sort of uh, brings this to the forefront. Uh, and, and I'll just read it. A recent study of patients aged 15 to 64 years receiving opioids for chronic non-cancer pain and followed up for, uh, for up to 13 years revealed that one in 550 patients died from opioid-related overdose within 2.6 years of their first prescription. So this wasn't street drugs, this was actually a script pad from a physician to a patient. One in 550 within 2.6 years had died of an overdose. But more shockingly, one in 32 patients who escalated to greater than 200 morphine milligram equivalents, which is your oxycotton and your oxycodone class, one in 32 had died within 2.6 years. That, that's just an incredible statistic. And I don't know in 22 years of practice that I've ever seen a statistic that was um, more shaking, uh, earth shaking than that. You know, that's ominous. Um, and we probably haven't seen the last of it. Um, so leading with an opioid pain medication, I think the majority of the healthcare world is starting to realize that that's probably not the best or most appropriate first step. But let's just take a look at chiropractic. When we look at spinal manipulation, when we look at biomechanical treatment, uh, this, this was the largest study ever conducted on chiropractic patients ever. And this was in 2015. This was um, about uh, 9 million patients with about, I think, 17 million office visits. And these were Medicare patients. And the reason this is interesting to me is because the Medicare Part B beneficiaries fall into that age bracket as listed here as 66 to 99 years of age. Now, if you're gonna apply a manual therapy to a patient population, um, you know, looking at the safety of that in a typically frail population is a really smart way to go, right? Because if anybody's got contraindications to spinal manipulation or chiropractic care because of frailty or pathological tissue or any of those things, it's certainly the senior citizen population. So taking all of those visits and looking at that population that received chiropractic care under Medicare, because it's covered, did anybody get hurt or what was the safety uh, track record? And what the authors wrote was no mechanism by which spinal manipulation induces injury and normal healthy tissue has been identified, but the likelihood of injury due to manipulation may be elevated in pathologically weakened tissues. That's why early access and early diagnosis is critical because if that tissue is pathologically weak, okay, osteoporotic fracture, disc extrusion, vascular fragility, we wanna know about that early so we can get them to the proper provider to care for them. And it has to be a properly trained chiropractor above and beyond just what's happening in school, okay? Spinal manipulation, or I'm sorry, an analyst of one, uh, analysis of 140 cases of adverse effects of spinal manipulation identified coagulation disorder or herniated nucleus pulposus as possible risk factors. Okay, so it was 140 cases of adverse effects out of 9 million patients. Um, to me, that's pretty astounding versus the other end of the spectrum, one in 32 patients who escalated to using oxycotton or oxycodone died within 2.6 years. 
And the outcomes really weren't that good with just managing pain. You know, we have to look at the safety and the biomechanical component. Now, when we looked at um, one of the more recent um, studies that really addressed additional safety of chiropractic and um, injury to the uh, carotid artery system and cervical artery dissection, okay, it was really important that we had a real group of people look at the review uh, of all the literature and look at the results. And this is, it was actually um, out of the neurosurgery department at Penn State. Okay, so a real department, real university, and a systematic review is a review of all the research that came before it. And that's why these are nice. They're kind of like the cliff notes of research, right? We can read one systematic review and get everything done um, before it. And in this paper, the author stated, the quality of the published literature on the relationship between chiropractic manipulation and cervical artery dissection is very low. Our analysis shows a small association between chiropractic neck manipulation and cervical artery dissection. This relationship may be explained by the high risk of bias and confounding in the available studies and by the known association of neck pain with uh, cervical artery dissection and with chiropractic manipulation. There is no convincing evidence to support a causal link between chiropractic manipulation and cervical artery dissection. Belief in a causal link may have significant negative consequences, such as numerous episodes of litigation. Now, what's very interesting is when we go back here and they talk about um, the likelihood of injury due to manipulation may be elevated in pathologically weakened tissues. So we mitigate a lot of this risk by making sure that our examination is looking for vascular causes of neck pain, vascular causes of headache. And all of our trained providers have continuing education and very deliberate screening processes for these issues. And that's a myriad of all um, concerns with contraindications to manual therapy, but more importantly, um, vascular. And because chiropractors are uh, designated as primary spine, or uh, I'm sorry, primary care providers in our specialty in every state, that allows us to order tests and triage. We're not working under the guidance of anybody. We're working alongside their primary care physician or their specialist. And these are things that we catch, and these are things that we, we, we can evaluate for and triage. So the level of safety goes up with education. Now, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, that the pain management component of chiropractic really started in 2010, 2011, but it peaked in 2012. And this was probably one of uh, the more important reviews. And again, what I have here is a systematic review and a meta-analysis of what did the research up to 2012 really talk about spinal manipulation and pain management. That's why when people get adjusted, they feel better, right? So the authors had written, reductions in pain sensitivity or hypoalgesia following spinal manipulation may be indicative of a mechanism related to the modulation of afferent input or central nervous system processing of pain. So it's not just local, we're affecting the brain and the spinal cord, okay? Subgroup analysis showed a significant effect of spinal manipulation therapy on remote sites of pressure stimulus, further supporting a potential influence on higher levels within the central nervous system. So as an example, if we have a patient who has contraindications to chiropractic care for their cervical spine, maybe they have stenosis or um, cervical artery disease, and we're not really gonna do anything at that level, but they have headaches, we can actually provide uh, chiropractic care to the middle back, the thoracic spine, and because of the central nervous system component, that remote site, which in this example would be the head, would definitely benefit from a reduction in pain. So we can manage even the sites that um, aren't directly underneath or involved with what we're adjusting. And that's done obviously in conjunction with medical care, but it provides a really nice option and a safe option for managing pain without the, the ways that we currently do it. So from a first phase of care, Okay, we looked at the management of pain, we looked at early access to care, and we also looked at safety compared to what's currently being done on a mass scale. And chiropractic, a properly trained chiropractor, really um, kind of trumps a lot of those things. You know, is this to say it's going to help everybody? Of course not. But as a first line of defense, um, with the option to get that patient under 
uh, medical care as soon as possible. Uh, it's a really smart way to go, and it's it's uh, clearly um, supported by the research. You know, this is just a um, a small portion of what's really published. Now, when the patient moves into phase two of care, okay, and phase one could be a couple of days, could be a couple of weeks. You know, if they're in an auto accident, that's different than if they're sore just from working. Okay, but the idea is that when we go through these phases of care, we want to keep the patient functioning as much as possible. We want to give them the power and the encouragement to continue on their daily lifestyle. So if we can manage them without drugs, without surgery, and keep them focusing on their family and work, generating income, supporting themselves and, and their families, that's really sort of the foundation of that of all phases. But when we get into phase two, we really want to find out what that mechanical problem is. Because a lot of times when patients come in, they're in too much pain for us to really move them around and really examine them. So we want to get them stabilized as quickly as possible. We want to have early access. We want to find out what the biomechanical problem is. If there's an anatomical issue that needs medical intervention, we get them to that uh, medic as quickly as possible, right? But phase two now is really about the biomechanical analysis. And we want to objectify what's going on. Is it a loss of curvature? Is it a malpositioned or a improperly rotated vertebrae? Is their pelvis tilted? What's the mechanical component? Because we have techniques to sort of undo that and to stabilize and balance the biomechanical component. Now, the reason this becomes important, okay, is really downstream. And what I mean by downstream is as the patient moves through the hierarchy of medical specialty, um, if they're not fixed, inevitably they're going to end up with a surgical consult. And in 2016, uh, this was uh, published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, okay, um, significant journal, and they followed 182 patients. And uh, at two-year follow-up, there was a subgroup that failed to reach minimal clinically important difference, okay? So there's criteria of hey, they're not completely out of pain, but they've made clinical improvement enough to actually show that the surgery was successful. There was a subgroup of these patients that didn't achieve that. And the reason that they didn't achieve that was because they had a biomechanical problem in their cervical spine, an undiagnosed cervical spine deformity. So here it's concomitant cervical positive sagittal alignment which means loss of lordosis or a biomechanical issue, a loss of curve. So the fact that the patient was fused with an undiagnosed biomechanical injury in an adjacent area is really sort of profound. And that's why we found in the chiropractic profession that even the patients that um, unfortunately have to undergo surgery, the ones that have been through chiropractic care leading up to it, always do bet much better in the short and the long term than um, than those that didn't. So how do we analyze this? How do we go through uh, this process and get this sort of um, information? The first phase really is our three-dimensional analysis, right? We're gonna look at gait. We're gonna look as one leg longer than the other. That gives us an indication of what's going on inside the body. Uh, we look at posture and we have a myriad of orthopedic tests. We can test the nerve, we can test the joints, we can compress things, we can stretch things, and we can get a really good idea of where the problem is, okay? Is it really low back pain or is this a secondary compensatory problem because of a shoulder problem or a neck problem? And we see that commonly. That's why a lot of patients don't respond to low back uh, care because that's not the primary problem. The primary problem is above it. And in the slide you saw before, particularly with the surgeons, okay, that could very well be a biomechanical problem in the neck, but we have to look for those things if and when the patient's not responding. So when we palpate the spine and we can feel for movement, that could be due to scar tissue, which is called a fixation, or it could be a rotated segment that's really hitting at end range, okay? But we need to analyze that. And if that patient's not getting better, we're gonna go to the next phase of analysis, which is with radiographs. Okay, so the patient comes in, we do our 3D analysis, we work on them, they get better, great, they go back to their life, awesome, come back when you feel like you need it, and we manage the ins and outs of spine pain while they're working and caring for their family. But we had early access, right? But if that patient doesn't get better, or they keep coming back, well, you know, maybe we got to look a little bit more in depth. 
And that's the same process as internal medicine, okay? Um, we're gonna do a urinalysis for your diabetes. Well, we're not able to control it. So let's really, now we gotta look a little bit more specifically, let's take your blood, okay? Um, those are really um, normal and commonplace processes in internal medicine. So when we look at radiographs, we're looking at radiographs for two reasons. One, is there some sort of undiagnosed um, pathology, a fracture um, or, or uh, arthritis or something that um, is prolonging your care? And by fracture, I mean a healed one, right? Because typically if there's a suspicion of a, an acute fracture, those x-rays would be done immediately. Um, and what does the spine look like segmentally? You know, let's measure. And there's criteria that we um, measure this by. We can do it either by hand, um, or we also have computerized programs that can plot these based on what an optimal configuration of the spine would look like. That way we know if it's really coming from the low back or it's the neck and we can intervene with low force techniques, um, high velocity, there's all sorts of different things that we can do. And we do that to make sure that the patient's comfortable. But in the end, what we really strive to do is prove what the biomechanical problem is so that we can fix it. And then we can communicate that to primary care physicians and medical specialists, okay? That's the corrective portion of what chiropractic does. Now, lastly, and probably most importantly from a case um, cost analysis perspective is the health maintenance phase. And we know if you have any um, sort of um, exposure to the, um, to the healthcare world, the billing and coding world, or the processes of, of how healthcare is paid for, we know that the most costly intervention is the initial intervention. You know, whether that's an uh, emergency room visit, whether it's an initial exam by a surgeon, initial exam by a primary care. So the idea of um, managing spine pain is relatively new to the world, but it's been a part of chiropractic for a really, really long time. And the reason chiropractic, one of the reasons that patients are extremely satisfied with chiropractic care, there's been numerous studies on that. And also um, the fact that we're cost effective is because we prevent patients from moving in and out of care from the acute phase. And think about it from an internal medicine perspective. You know, we don't expect people to move in and out of care with diabetes, we, we learned a long time ago that I can prevent diabetic ulcers, I can pet, uh, prevent uh, diabetic neuropathy if I'm managing that diabetes along the way. I also know that I don't wanna have somebody wait for a clogged artery to be rushed to the emergency room and then to the cardiothoracic surgeon for uh, open heart surgery when I can catch them when they're young and manage the blood pressure, manage the cholesterol and the triglycerides and all that. So we already have a health maintenance care plan for internal medicine disorders. But because most medical providers operate in that internal medicine paradigm, even pain management, you know, the, from an internal medicine perspective, they're working chemically to control inflammation and pain. But chiropractic has a very interesting track record. And this paper was published in 2011 which was right around when all the pain um, management and spinal manipulation um, papers came out. And what they said in 2011 was uh, after controlling for demographics and severity indicators, the likelihood of recurrent disability due to low back pain for recipients of services during the health maintenance care period by all other provider groups was consistently worse when compared with recipients of health maintenance care by chiropractors. And that was a very interesting and profound study because what we find is that it's the biomechanical component that recurs and creates a significant enough amount of pain where the patient has to take a day off of work, calls in sick, doesn't do something with their family, and then we're starting over again. Then they're taking a pain pill and it's this vicious cycle. But if we can manage those problems. Maybe they have a scoliosis. Maybe they have an old work-related disc injury. Maybe they have an old compression fracture that's healed. Maybe it's a case of a patient that's had multiple surgeries. Okay, we're very good at managing that because if you can balance the biomechanical component, the patient's going to do a lot better. And that's why it's really, really important. So lastly, when we look at the final aspect of this short little presentation, 
you know, we want to update the way that we view spine care. And the outdated model is that we're leading with anatomical treatment. That's less than 5% of all spine cases. Let's create a paradigm, which is what we're doing with the Academy of Chiropractic across the globe, uh, is leading with the mechanical component, but it can't just be to a provider that understands the biomechanical component because you can't miss the 5% that have true medical conditions that need to be triaged. That's why graduate level training with the Academy of Chiropractic is critically important because we need to catch those things. That's the first thing. The second thing in the outdated model is looking at the spine regionally. We've moved to a full spine model. So for us and what the literature is starting to support, there's no such thing as really cervical spine pain or lumbar spine pain anymore. It's spine pain. And that gives us the ability to treat the spine as one organ system that's codependent on itself. And all of these areas and all of these sections of the spine work together to allow us to move and to work and to enjoy our life. So in conclusion, when we look at where chiropractic's place is, it's at the forefront. It's at it, providing early access to diagnosis and then triaging according to biomechanical or medical. And the 95% where it's just mechanical, we can manage their pain. We can do it without narcotics. We can do it without surgery. And the literature is supporting that. The literature also supports early access as soon as possible. The wait and see approach for spine care has been a failed paradigm for a very, very long time. And that's important. Once the patient is comfortable and stabilized, now we can find out really what's wrong. Is it a primary lesion in the low back or is it a mechanical lesion in the neck? That's the problem. And that's where we fix it. And our communication between the patient and their other medical providers is critically important. And we do an awful lot of training on that. Once the uh, problem is fixed, then we can determine, is it fixed and good forever? Can we give the patient exercises to do at home? Can they go to a yoga class once a month and maintain it? Or do we need to intervene because they're working in the field, they're working in a factory? Um, and maybe, you know, they have underlying pre-existing issues, but the, the properly trained chiropractor is designed to sit or has been trained and the treatment is designed to sit with the patient and work through that. That's the difference between a patient centered approach and a treatment centric model. Treatment centric model is you have back pain. You're going to go this route. Patient centered is let's find the cause and let's tailor a treatment plan directly to what you do and what you do in your life. I hope that helps to understand, helps you to understand what we're doing with the Academy of Chiropractic and how really in the area that you're looking to implement this, that um, it could have a profound effect on cost, patient satisfaction, and really truly reducing opioid use, unnecessary surgery by simply focusing initially on the mechanical aspect of pain and having that patient be examined sooner rather than later. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.